good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to this edition of Aerospace Nation. Uh, today, I'm really pleased to announce the launch of our new Mitchell Institute Center for UAV and Autonomy Studies, or MIUAS, led by Dr. Caitlin Lee. A part of this new center's mission is to bring together thought leaders to inform and elevate the debate on UAVs, artificial intelligence, and the future of war. Joining Caitlin and I today are two people who are doing cutting edge thinking on the role that next generation UAVs might play in pure conflict, specifically with China. Tim Grayson is a special assistant to the Secretary of the Air Force for mission-centered analysis and operational imperatives. He previously led pathbreaking work leading the DARPA Strategic Technology Office, including the Air Combat Evolution Program, which famously used machine, human machine dogfighting as a way to increase trust in combat autonomy. And also with us is Dave Ockmanek, a long-term friend and senior defense researcher at the RAND Corporation. And from 2009 to 2014, he was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Force Development. He's been at the forefront of analysis to reverse unsettling shifts in the military balance over places like the Taiwan Strait and the Baltic states where U.S. dominance is giving way to our adversaries. So welcome, gentlemen, and thanks to all of you, both of you, for joining us today. What I'd like to do now is turn this over to Caitlin to give you all an overview of the strategic challenges that we're facing and how that plays into our decision to stand up a research center devoted entirely to the studies of UAVs and autonomy. So, Caitlin, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, General Deptula. There is now an extensive body of research, analysis, gaming uh, developed here at Mitchell, RAND, and other think tanks and government organizations that indicates our armed forces currently lack the capability and the capacity required to defend our allies and partners from the threats posed by China and Russia. China in particular has developed networks of very long range missiles, electronic warfare systems, and other power projection capabilities that could severely limit or even prevent the ability of the US to defend its interests in the Indo-Pacific, including the defense of Taiwan. Secretary of the Air Force Frank Kendall has said the service does not have a moment to lose in its efforts to modernize nuclear and conventional forces to meet this challenge. And the Air Force, with its ability to project power on short notice, may be first into this fight, which could occur with little or no notice and could require a rapid and massive deployment of resources. Given this challenge, the Air Force is working hard to identify and mitigate posture and capability gaps as quickly as it can. And UAVs may have an important role to play in this fight. Now, of course, we're not going to fill every capability gap with a UAV, but we now have a demonstrated combat record of over 20 years in Afghanistan and Iraq, where we have seen the range and persistence that current generation UAVs like Reaper and Predator can provide. <clears throat> These aircraft have revolutionized our ability to do a range of missions in low intensity conflict. Before we fielded these drones, we really didn't have a good way to close the kill chain for high value targeting. Just remember the hunt for bin Laden in the 1990s. And it was also tough to get that persistent stare of the battle space that's really required for effective targeting in support of close air support and strike missions. Predator and Reaper made that capability commonplace. And at the same time, it's indisputable that our current generation UAVs have reduced risk to air crews, and they often have done so at lower cost than manned aircraft. Now we see the potential to build a new generation of UAVs to increase the operational effectiveness of our forces at the higher end of the conflict spectrum. Innovations in material science, 3D printing, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and other technologies are creating new possibilities. But we will need innovative thinking to get there. We need to understand more about the roles, missions, and attributes that these next generation UAVs and related technologies may need to be useful in a high-end conventional warfighting scenario. We also will need to think hard about the acquisition strategy that we will want to use to build and deploy these new UAVs. Our old model of closed innovation where a few inventors with top secret clearances quickly and effectively design and build inventions like nuclear weapons or stealth may not be so pro appropriate in an age when technology is changing so fast and is available to so many. And we'll also need to think about the people. 
We have spent two decades building up an exquisite level of institutional knowledge regarding both the development and employment of drone technology. How can we preserve and leverage that rich resource to develop a next generation of UAV technologies, capabilities, and concepts? These are just some of the fascinating questions we hope to address with the new Mitchell Institute Center for UAV and Autonomy Studies. Ultimately, our goal is to inform and elevate the national security debate around UAVs and autonomy with objective, nonpartisan ideas and analysis. And I really can't think of a better way to start living up to that mission than by bringing together the group we have today to discuss the potential role that UAVs and related technologies could play in a confrontation with China, which is currently the pacing threat facing U.S. force planners today. Well, Caitlin, um, thanks for that. And uh, uh, now to elaborate on this idea of what, uh, what war with China might actually look like, um, I'd like to turn to you, Dave, and ask that you give us a a brief overview of your perspective on these topics. So over to you. Thanks, Dave, and I will keep it brief. I'm sure most everybody on this line uh, has thought extensively about what conflict with China might look like. We think that as force planners, we think that a, a, an invasion of Taiwan is the most appropriate scenario to use because of China's repeatedly uh, expressed desire to forcibly reincorporate Taiwan into the mainland if necessary and because of the severe time crunch that would be associated with defeating an invasion of Taiwan. U.S. and allied forces may have as few as a week to 10 days to either defeat this uh, invasion or accept the fait accompli. And the Chinese understand that if they're to succeed in this, they have to either deter the United States from intervening or radically suppress our combat operations in the theater. And so, again, as everybody knows, the, the extensive anti-access area denial capabilities that China has deployed over the last 20 plus years are gonna be brought to bear in this conflict. We'll see intensive attacks with accurate ballistic and cruise missiles on our bases. We'll see a world-class integrated air defense over the battle space supplemented by increasingly capable fighters and fighter air crews. We'll see attacks on our space-based sensors, our PNT, our communications. We'll see uh, t attacks on our command and control. The PLA is obsessed with the importance of information in modern warfare, and they're determined to deny us information superiority. So with, with all of this, our forces are gonna be confronted with the need to, to um, not just you know, gain air superiority, which is always a priority for the commander, but to actually reach into this con con contested battle space, basically from H hour and find the enemy and engage the enemy's operational center of gravity. Those hundreds of ships carrying the amphibious forces across the strait, the airborne air assault uh, air aircraft carrying uh, light infantry across the strait. Um, do that even in the absence of air superiority, which is a very different concept of operations from what our forces have have operated with in the post-Cold War era. So I'll leave it at that for now. Happy to, to elaborate on that if that would be useful. Well, thanks very much, Dave. Um, Tim, given the work that um, you've done thinking about UAVs in the context of a China fight, could you tell us a bit about the uh, Air Force's ongoing efforts to meet some of the challenges that uh, Dave just laid out and how you see UAVs fitting into that mix? Sure, uh, and uh, so I, as you said in, in the intro, my full-time job right now is supporting these uh, operational imperatives that the uh, secretary has laid out. And uh, two of those operational imperatives squarely relate to UAVs. Uh, and we, we can talk more about it in the course of the discussion today, but they're referred to as the family of systems. Uh, one associated with NGAD, another associated with B-21. Uh, in both cases, the thought there is in the term family of systems that you've got a crude, you know, human piloted aircraft working as a team, you know, with some mix of, of autonomous platforms. Uh, now, you know, what's, you know, people's minds typically go to the classic four ship, you know, with, with you know, the, the lead being human, the, the wingman being autonomous. That could be a model. But you can also think of a lot of other more dynamic uh, mix and match of things. Uh, you know, let's start from what we know works today. Uh, we have effectively autonomous ISR today. 
uh, yeah, some of the earlier uh, UAVs uh, are remotely piloted, but we have things like uh, Global Hawk that uh, it is at the waypoint level. And, you know, going back to my days as a program manager at DARPA in the late 90s, we were already looking at things like how do you select waypoints autonomously and how do you, uh, how, how do you uh, avoid threats when you, you fly those waypoints? You know, so you can imagine things like sensing and automating some of that sensing mission uh, happening separate from the proverbial foreship of that human machine team. Uh, in general, when you look at autonomy across the board, you know, people talk about robotics as doing the dull and the dangerous. So I would put things like flying those ISR missions where, you know, I don't know that we'll necessarily uh, fly racetracks in that A2AD environment that Dave described, but nevertheless, you know, flying some kind of repetitive ISR mission, great candidate that falls more toward the dull side of things. Uh, you know, on the dangerous side of things, when you look at these uh, family of systems kind of designs, uh, we can afford to take more risk with the uncrewed platform uh, in twofold. The obvious one is we don't have a human pilot that we risk the life of. In addition to that, uh, there's an interesting trade that we could talk more about as we go through related to the cost of the platform. If we start looking at really diversifying the types of missions, uh, you could get to the point where uh, it is, as the price goes down, uh, I can afford to take more risk with it. Uh, you know, even to the point, you know, the, 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 the end game of that is where it becomes so-called attributable. Uh, at that point in time, I can start thinking about missions entirely differently, where I am prioritizing mission effectiveness over survivability. You know, not that we wouldn't want something that's still pretty expensive. To, you know, we would like it to come home if it can, but survivability doesn't become the top requirement. And that really opens the aperture of the types of missions that I can then consider. Yeah, no, I'd also add that uh, as you're speaking there, it also adds to the deterrent equation. Uh, because if your adversary understands that you're willing to take risks um, with unmanned aircraft that you normally wouldn't otherwise, that induces uh, a degree of uncertainty in their decision calculus as well. But let me, let me turn that kind of consideration over to Dave and ask um, what are some of the operational and environmental factors that uh, we need to be considering when designing UAVs in the China fight? Um, some of these have already been mentioned, but for example, how might basing decisions, uh, the threat, logistics, maintenance, um, or even weather for that matter, impact the kinds of UAVs that we want to have in a highly contested operating environment? Yeah, so I'm gonna pick up on Tim's theme of the dangerous environment. Um, we're increasingly intrigued with the potential importance of getting back to the military principle of mass. Right for many many years, um, this country's been on a on a vector of increasingly sophisticated, expensive platforms in ever smaller numbers. And we've seen, you know, the inventory of of combat aircraft in the in the Air Force decrease because of this uh, this ineluctable uh, uh, trend of increasing cost per platform. Um, that had a strong rationale when we had technical and operational superiority over our adversaries and when in fact we were we were very concerned about attrition but uh, the advent of autonomy means that we have the opportunity now to flood the battle space essentially with inexpensive platforms that can that can do the jobs that human beings have in the past done and and do them actually more robustly than uh, than than man concepts so so if, so if you think about mass, then you have to think about ex the cost. When we think about cost in aircraft, um, I learned a long time ago that we buy airplanes by the pound. So we're talking small, which means small payloads, which means also inexpensive payloads like commercial off-the-shelf imaging uh, sensors, um, radars, e e uh, electro-optical sensors, and so forth. And then, and then the other key factor I would, I would point to in this environment is the growing 
uh, threat to air bases. Um, the Air Force has been quite aware of this for some time. There's a lot of energy and work going into concepts like ACE, Agile Combat Employment. Uh, but I would offer that uh, with, despite all of that, we have not solved the problem of the, of the, of the missile threat to air bases. Our active defenses are expensive. They're not impermeable. Uh, they can be overwhelmed by modest sized salvos. And yet we need to, we need to operate from inside the threat ring in order to generate the kind of combat power that is called for by these intensive operations. And so finding ways to, to generate air power while freeing ourselves from reliance on fixed facilities, fixed air bases, and especially runways is also important. And there are concepts now that, that, that offer both uh, affordability in terms of small size, uh, unmanned and autonomous capabilities, and, and aircraft such as the uh, XQ-58 that can be launched and recovered by mobile teams without reliance on fixed facilities. And I think the combination of those things really creates impressive opportunities for the Air Force going forward. Uh, thanks for that, Dave. Now, Tim, the operational imperatives that the Secretary has defined describe roles for UAVs supporting the, or working in conjunction with uh, B-21 and uh, Next Generation Air Dominance or NGAD. How are you going about developing uh, concepts and missions and capabilities uh, for these UAVs? So, uh, great question, and it highlights how we're looking at the the operational imperatives or the so-called OIs across the board. It, it really is a bit of a cultural change for the way the department has traditionally built and fielded new types of capabilities in that uh, it's, it's fundamentally about solving problems. So one of the really insightful things the secretary did in creating the OIs, uh, and this is where the term operational imperative comes in. Each of these OI teams, and there are seven of them, uh, have an operational as well as a capabilities lead. Uh, these are, these are uh, typically uh, officers from either the MAGCOMs or, or possibly uh, uh, headquarters air staff. And, and at the, you know, typically the, the general officer level. And they provide insight into not just requirements, but new warfighting concepts. So we've got these teams that are technologists and acquisition people married up with warfighters who can actually say, how do we solve new problems? What are new missions we can do? Uh, how do we address that kind of uh, really daunting pacing threat that Dave described? And not be limited to the classic requirements flow down. You know, one of, one of the things that I, I always, whenever I talk about the OIs, I like to get the message out for our industry partners is that we're trying to do the same kind of engagement with industry. Uh, early in the OI process, there were some RFIs that went out, and I'm very grateful for the companies that did respond there. Um, we need to go further. You know, the RFI process is a little bit too uh, traditional tied to, you know, how we do a procurement flow down. Uh, instead, I'm trying to engage industry with the same question that the OI teams are looking at themselves. But don't just tell me what a new requirement is, you know, or, or what a new capability is that I can draw a relevancy line back to one of the OIs. Let's solve the problem. You know, so I'm really trying to get both on the Department of Air Force side as well as the uh, industry side, thinking about entirely new missions, entirely new warfighting concepts that then UAVs and the other capabilities involved in the OIs can help address and work that iteratively. Now, that's great. I mean, thanks for that insight, uh, uh, Tim. Uh, Dave, can you give us a couple of examples of how adding UAVs to a long range strike or air superiority mission could open up some new ways of thinking about um, what we've characterized as bomber and fighter concepts of operation um, or concepts of employment? Sure. Um, we're doing some simulations that uh, capture uh, scenarios in which we're trying to rapidly sink that uh, invasion fleet in the strait. We're also trying to clear the skies of uh, PLA fighters, uh, transports, and attack helos, transport helos. Um, so think of this. Imagine a thousand uh, unmanned UAVs 
over Taiwan and over the Taiwan Strait. They're, uh, they're not large aircraft, but they are flying at a high subsonic speed. Uh, you can imagine making their radar cross-sections indistinguishable from that of an F-35. Uh, and, and the UAVs are basically out in front. They're doing the sensing mission. The manned aircraft are kind of hanging back. Imagine now being a, a SA-21 operator on the, on the mainland of China or, uh, or on one of the surface action groups trying to protect. Your scopes are flooded with these things that you've got to kill. If you don't kill those sensors, we're going to find you. And if we find you, we're going to kill you. So A, we're, 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 we're creating defilade, if you will, camouflage for the, for the manned aircraft to hide behind. B, uh, we're potentially exhausting the enemy's magazines of expensive SAMs. Uh, and on the right side of the cost uh, price cost exchange ratio, uh, see you could put some jammers on a few of these uh, UAVs as well to further uh, uh, suppress the effectiveness of the SAMs. And then the key is the this is this these UAVs create a sensing grid that tell you where the targets are on the surface, where the targets are in the air, so that the F-35s, F-22s can conduct their engagements passively. You never have to turn on your radar. You know what that means for survivability. So we call the we we call these UAVs the pilot's friend. Now I know there's a you know culturally there may be some sense of competition between unmanned and unmanned and so forth. And Kate, Caitlin actually wrote her dissertation on this. Um, but uh, from an operational perspective, we do not see a downside here in terms of the synergy between manned and unmanned in this model. I can't tell you how, uh, how promising that sounds. And as somebody who was in the middle of those yeah. ostensible debates between manned and unmanned uh, while still on active duty, I would just shake my head. Um, uh, first off, I don't know any self-respecting fighter pilot that would wear a white silk scarf. But second off, it's not about what you fly. It's about the desired outcome or the effects one can achieve if you think in a campaign context, and that's what you just described. So I think it's really exciting um, in those mature warfighters out there uh, get by the, uh, the the newspaper headline hype that they try to foist on us uh, and, and divide us. Um, but Tim, let me, let me, let's expand a bit what Dave described and talk about the manned unmanned teaming force structure implications. Now, the secretary's commented that the B-21 UAVs likely, or the UAVs associated with the B-21, uh, would likely cost about half as much as the bomber. Well, that puts the number around 325, uh, 350, 100,000 per UAV. Now, we don't really know what the price tag is on NGAB, but the idea is also to get the UAV price down to about half. Frankly, I think we, we need to, <laughs> to do a tenth of that. But to this point, uh, Secretary Kendall said that UAVs are going to mitigate the high cost of NGAD and B-21. And General Brown recently commented that unmanned aircraft may actually alleviate the need to procure more B-21s. And I know you can't go into programmatic details, but could you kind of fill in uh, some perspectives in this regard? Yeah, absolutely. Um... And again, I'll, I'll talk conceptually here because a lot of this is still very much a work in progress. But, uh, you know, you highlight a couple of things. First of all, when, when the secretary has tossed out numbers like that, that is a, a challenge problem to these OI teams that, quite frankly, should be used, thought of as uh, essentially a threshold requirement. And to your point, there's very much a push to say, and can we do better? So the teams have been working very aggressively to find options to push down well below, uh, you know, the, that half kind of number. Um, and the, the challenge there becomes, you know, we don't, for all of the great research work that's been done on swarming, you know, quadcopters and things like that, we still need combat credible capability. So there will be only so far you can go. That's why I'm not willing to, to come out and say that there's options for expendable, but we could start approaching those attributable numbers. Uh, you know, so that, that's the first thing I'll say is that there is that push to 
go well below half. That, that's, that's the threshold. The second thing is a combination of some of the attributes that, that UAVs bring at the platform level and how they're designed and how they're used, just combined with modern digital engineering principles, is allowing us from a technology side, and again, this is the theme in the OIs of a family of systems, uh, to not think about every new UAV as a separate platform program. You know, when, whenever historically we have acquired platforms uh, as a program, there's a whole bunch of what I'll call pedestal costs that go along with that program. Obviously, there's just the, you know, the program overhead and the initiation costs and things. But, but even, you know, going through, you know, manufacturing, uh, tooling up for a new line, uh, the parts, the sustainment, the, you know, all of those things involved in the whole life cycle of a platform. If every single time we put out a new designator number or a new model number for something, and it's a separate new program, then we are going to bust the budget. But we don't have to do that. Between, again, the thinking in terms of family of systems and some of the way that, that UAVs are designed, and, and then we can go into other things about modular architectures and, and open architectures and such, we've got the potential to think about multiple classes of these UAVs tied to one family of systems from, from some really small, uh, you know, Dave, Dave mentioned something that's very difficult to get around, the cost per pound types of numbers. But if we can vary the mission and you can dial the mission, you can also start playing games with the size of the platform. I might need some where I want them to bring mass and that's gonna have to be still a pretty big platform and a fairly expensive platform. But if I can manage to have multiple of these designs without busting the budget by having multiple separate distinct programs. You know, now I could think of the lower end things as well with a very dedicated focus mission that can have a smaller, cheaper payload and therefore the overall platform becomes significantly cheaper. So those are the kinds of trades we're looking at. I would argue even on the NRE side of things where you, where you think that the, you know, the development work that goes into inventing a new platform, there's a lot of, of technical opportunity out there to, um, you, you know, whether, whether it is sort of the modular approach to platforms themselves or just the design tools, you know, things like digital twins and some of the model-based system engineering that might, you know, really even mitigate the per platform, per model number uh, uh, design cost. Uh, and then the, the, the last big hurdle then becomes, can we figure out the, the acquisition and the procurement strategy that bundles all those things together? But again, without being able to go into specifics, we've got a, a really excellent uh, 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 a PEO out in Dayton, uh, led by Brigadier General Dale White, uh, who is thinking a lot of these kinds of things and really doing some fantastic work. Well, actually, that's very insightful. Uh, thank you for those remarks. I would, as you were speaking, I was also thinking that um, just this concept that you've described uh, in part um, also opens up um, organizational and, um, and personnel considerations too. Um, and I think will drive the service away from sort of that industrial age method of organization where we took like platforms and put them together in, in divisions, wings, groups, squadrons, and integrate um, in a more composite fashion, these UAVs with their um, associated uh, larger platforms, whether it be B-21 uh, or NGAD. And that certainly opens up venues for not just leverage, but also uh, 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 cost savings. Um, one follow-up, uh, Tim. Um, <laughs> Ed Mitchell, we've been uh, pretty far out in front on this particular topic, but I'd like to take every opportunity to remind people that the Air Force has been the least funded relative to the Air Force and the Navy for 28 years in a row now, and that ranking was repeated in the FY23 budget proposal, um, even though the Air Force did pretty good internally, at least in OSD's eyes. Um, given that the Air Force is on the hook for two thirds of the nation's nuclear modernization, as well as long delayed aircraft recapitalization of its geriatric force. As some of us believe that since we're no longer in Iraq and Afghanistan, it's time to shift 
the thrift $53 billion a year more that the Army's been getting than the Air Force for the years, 20 years after 9-11, back to the Air Force. From a wave top level, is the Air Force leadership willing to advocate for the funding to develop these UAVs in addition to all the other demands on the Air Force? So I, I certainly don't want to speak for uh, the Secretary of the Chiefs, but uh, what I will tell you is when Secretary Kendall established these operational imperatives, uh, one of the fundamental, most important mandates that was given to these study teams that are developing new, these new concepts is that they must be uh, fully supported by solid operations analysis. And that operations analysis it includes an operational return on investment. Uh, so on, on the one hand, uh, what that says is it's not an open license just to gold plate things and throw in everything, including the kitchen sink. There has to be some economic discipline to, to, to thinking about problems. But at the same time, in that guidance to the teams, uh, he was clear, tell me what the Air Force needs. Tell me what we need to, to beat China. Uh, let's, let's get the options on the table. Uh, and not worry about do they fit within, you know, a current POM. Um, now, that being said, we, we still have to comply with, with fiscal guidance. We still have to, you know, build a POM. So that's going to be further homework. But in terms of generating the concepts and getting the solid analytic backing to say, no kidding, these are the concepts we need, that is the work the OIs are doing. And so certainly uh, it's my personal hope that we're going to be able to you know, equip him and, and, and General Brown and, and General Raymond as well with the ideas and the data they need to, to go have those discussions that, that you're referring to. That's great news. Great to hear. And it also points to the whole notion of moving the entire department's measures of merit toward one of cost per effect or outcome as opposed to individual unit cost. And it sounds to me that's what you just described. Now what we have to do is get the de department to actually own up and start doing analysis that way across all the services and not protecting them uh, with these artificial uh, 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 budget stovepipes. But let's move on to a discussion of the data link software and autonomous systems that can enable manned unmanned teaming in a stressing scenario uh, uh, like the, a China fight over Taiwan Strait. But Dave, could you speak to some of the challenges in using data links to control UAVs in this environment? And given these challenges, what are some of the alternatives to using traditional, very vulnerable um, RF data links? Yeah. So we all know that the EMS environment in, in any conflict with China or Russia, for that matter, is going to be very, very demanding. Um, we also know that if you want to have literally hundreds to up to thousands of UAVs operating in the battle space, it's not going to be practical to have them all be remotely piloted, particularly when your space-based comms are under intensive attack, both lethal and non-lethal. So, so uh, again, we think autonomy provides the opportunity to untether uh, these things from, from human control. Tim mentioned waypoint uh, uh, level of autonomy that we have today, but this is, this is the, the image we have is you send these, these things out to the battle space and they are talking, so to speak, among themselves. When someone sees something of interest, oh, that looks like a Renhai, uh, they'll gang up on it and you'll get multiple looks with different phenomenologies from multiple angles. They'll share data. The automatic target recognition function will turn those data into a nominated target. And as weapons come in, the mesh itself will grab that weapon and say, your primary target is this. I'm not only going to assign you to that target, I'm going to help you hit 47 feet after the bow so you maximize your probability of kill against that particular platform. Uh, when a recent Air Force war game, I was briefing this concept to the adjudication team. And I think it's fair to say the adjudicators were a little bit skeptical about all the magic we were invoking for this sensing grid. And one of them asked, well, who's going to command and control all these hundreds of UAVs? I said, the same guy who commands and controls the 10,000 Uber drivers on the island of Manhattan. 
It's not Mildred sitting at a switchboard saying, Joe, you go to the corner of 42nd and Broadway. No, it's the AI. It's not that hard, uh, given the state of current computing, to, uh, to imagine a system where um, the, 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 the targeting grid is, is, quote, commanding and controlling itself. Now, we want human oversight, right? ATR is not perfect. It's getting better. Uh, we've done a lot of analysis of that, but, all, you, but, but whenever you can, you want uh, humans to be overseeing the performance of the grid. And so, you know, by having these things shuttling back and forth from launch and recovery areas in the rear, there will be daisy chain opportunities among the UAVs to transmit, transmit those, those data links to the rear. You could also imagine Global Hawk or high altitude balloons as, as airborne radio relays. So, so uh, we think you can have the best of both worlds. You can have an autonomously functioning system that you have a lot of confidence in getting right, but at the same time, have human oversight to ensure that the enemy hasn't unleashed some uh, unforeseen tricks on us that is fooling the ATRs. No, that's great. Um, Tim, can you uh, talk a bit, actually expand upon uh, Dave's remarks there and uh, talk about the role of... Uh, artificial intelligence and how it might play in uh, uh, interacting with this whole notion of man on man teaming uh, and enabling closer collaboration between uh, many, many numbers of UAVs and give us some insight into the future for Skyborg, the Air Force's AI brain and how that technology is gonna feed into these uh, partners for NGAD and B-21. Yeah, so, so first, first of all, you know, th this whole discussion about the comms and autonomy is near and dear to my heart from former life uh, at DARPA with our whole uh, mosaic warfare concept and, and large degree of dynamic interoperability there. The, the, within the OIs, we are addressing some of the connectivity that Dave talked about. Uh, it, you know, we've got an OI that is explicitly focused on uh, getting operational value and figuring out how to field and operate uh, the AVMS uh, capability, uh, uh, advanced battle management system. Uh, tied to that, there's new work going on on, on links. Uh, there is under another OI study, the Resilient Space Order of Battle, looking at how do we have a full space data transport layer. So we've got all those different pieces together to provide uh, resilient, uh, uh, the term we used before in my, in my mosaic world was optionality. You know, how, do you, how can you make sure you've got more than one pathway to connect uh, a human to one of these UAVs? But he, he's absolutely right. You know, the, you've got uh, levels of autonomy in the UAVs themselves. You minimize how much control is needed by the humans. I'll, I'll add one more thing to that. There are also different scales. You know, so for example, if I've got the, uh, you know, the, the human, and I said before, we're not doing necessarily four ship formations, but you know, if we've got the, the, the human and, and his or her, you know, proverbial autonomous wingman, you may have more level of control, still not necessarily joystick control, but more level of control by that pilot and those immediate platforms than you would at a higher headquarters. You know, to the higher headquarters, the entire, you know, proverbial foreship is nothing but a, uh, you know, a, a hex on a map that now becomes something else to be able to control as part of a broader uh, fabric of capability. The other thing that has come up, and this was largely, I, I apologize, I've actually only been in the Department of Air Force for a couple of months, and I, I don't know much about the specifics of Skyborg, but what I can speak to that, that's similar to Skyborg is something from my old office at DARPA that you mentioned uh, in the introduction, the Air, Air Combat Evolution ACE program. And one of the key insights that gets exactly to your question is uh, what we refer to as human machine symbiosis. It's a sharing of responsibilities. So, you know, Dave already mentioned the fact that, you know, we're still not up to going, you know, full, uh, and maybe never will be frankly, full, full RoboCop letting the, the, the UAVs decide their own targets. But in the ACE program, we saw that, you know, there is an incredible, and for the pilots out here who are on the, the, the uh, 
uh, the meeting. I don't have to explain this to you. But there is an incredible cognitive load involved in flying a tactical aircraft if you, if you do sort of the, the, the cognitive science aspect of it. But from a computer science perspective, those are considered closed world problems. They're, they're, they're well-defined. You know, I know my aircraft position and state. I, you know, someone has already told me that's the target. Or that's the waypoint. The mechanics of flying the aircraft and figuring out energy management and time distance and all those kind of things. That's the kind of, of calculation that computers can really sink their, their silicon brains into. What that does is it frees up the human cognition to work some of those bigger picture problems. So one of the things we actually saw in ACE is a possible future where the blurring of what's the UAV and what's the manned aircraft starts, starts to become very ambiguous. You could imagine a, a, a crude platform that is not a UAV still be autonomous, where most of the operations of that platform are being done. You might, you might think of it to make it a little more palatable to the pilots. You might think of it like a really, really good autopilot. Uh, but that frees up the human being to think the bigger battle management kind of pictures and, uh, and, and do the kind of functions that humans still way excel above the machine. Yeah, no, that's great. <clears throat> and um, to a degree, we're already there with aircraft like um, F-35 and, uh, and F-22. Um, well, thank you both uh, and Caitlin, too, for that rich uh, discussion um, I did want to save some time for questions from the audience, and so we're going to move to that realm. Um, most of you in the audience are uh, old hands at this. Uh, please feel free to direct your question to one or more of the panelists. Um, and when you are called upon, uh, state your uh, name and affiliation before asking the question. You can also use the Q&A uh, comment piece, and uh, I think that's how we'll get started because we've got a a couple of good ones. Let me kick this off with a question from uh, David Shaw. Uh, and it goes back to the to the comment on uh, Uber. Uber doesn't need to contend with constrained bandwidth in a contested environment. Usually I see presentations with lots of lightning bolts and little consideration of the communications links. How do we accelerate interest in enabling communications technology? And I'm just going to jump on here um, and add to Dave's or reiterate the importance of his question because fundamental to many of these concepts, JADC2, ABMS is connectivity, assured connectivity. So I think that's the essence of his question. Either of you, please. So I, I can jump in on that. We've done a, so we've done a lot of analysis on the jamming environment and how it affects the comms and absolutely. Uh, assured comms are central to this concept of the sensing grid. The grid has to be able to talk within itself. It has to be able to talk to incoming weapons, and it has to be able to communicate with human beings in the rear for that oversight function. We've, uh, we looked at uh, uh, eight, eight different classes of radios and different frequency bands. We looked at different jamming threats in terms of their proximity and intensity and so forth in the straight. And we concluded that in the 5G band and the high 5G band, even very intensive comm jamming can't prevent the, 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 the UAVs in the mesh from communicating, from linking with one another. And we're talking about a density in which there's never more than 10 kilometers between UAVs in that mesh. So that 10 kilometer link distance was our threshold value. And uh, we're quite confident that even with with, with fairly low power off the shelf radio, you can sustain that level of connectivity, even in the presence of highly powerful jammers. Um, now, you, you're, as you go further to the rear, and I'm thinking eastward from the Taiwan Strait, the jamming threat naturally becomes less intensive. Uh, and so you can tolerate, so, so, the, so it, it becomes easier and easier to link to uh, uh, airborne relay posts as you go further to the rear. So, so uh, once you've solved that uh, jamming threat in the face of the enemy over the strait itself, uh, we're the, the, the keeping the, the mesh tethered to uh, the outside world 
and to incoming weapons, we think is a lesser included case. But we're quite confident that, that that's a solvable problem with current technology. Very good. Tim, anything to add? Yeah, I'll take a slightly different uh, tack here. Uh, first of all, I mentioned before that under some of the JADC2 types of, con or the, well, JADC2 and ABMS types of concepts, you know, we're looking at not so much create the unjammable link, but create the ability to relay data through multiple pathways to get resilient comms through that, that path diversity. Um, so, and to, to Dave, to build off Dave's point though, you still have to go the last mile, but as he pointed out, there are options for that last mile. But the other thing I'll say is that you also have to think about how much data do I really need? And that's the other thing we have to be cautious about is, is get, to get away from the mindset again of an RPV where, you know, I've got someone in a trailer, you know, doing stick and rudder. That takes a lot of bandwidth. We're not really talking about a lot of bandwidth here and, and to just uh, you know, riff off of the Uber analogy a little bit. The reality is Uber doesn't need a lot of bandwidth because you have this autonomous entity that's called the Uber driver. And that you, know, you, you need enough data to get some situation awareness of where are the customers and where are the Uber drivers. And then I do a battle management task assignment to say, Uber driver, you, you go and pick up this passenger. That doesn't take a ton of data. And, and at the end of the day, the Uber driver is the one that's then navigating the street, avoiding, uh, you know, avoiding uh, uh, problems and getting to that passenger. We got to think about the autonomous systems the same way, truly treat them as autonomous partners, where it's the same amount of data that you'd be sharing, you know, with a human wingman uh, that we're worried about connectivity to UAVs. So we have to have something, but it's not going to be as stressful, I think, as a lot of people imagine. Yeah, I, Tim reminded me to add something to that. Um, we're processing the data at the edge. On board these UAVs, we're turning data into information. That means that, just as Tim said, we that the 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 the, the demands on the bandwidth to communicate that processed information to the rear are much more modest than sending back FMV, full motion video, in a constant stream. We're thinking one tenth of a megabyte per second is is more than sufficient to uh, to to pass what we need back and forth between the mesh and the rear areas. Oh, that's a good point. Thanks for that. Here's one from uh, Brian Anderson. And uh, Tim, this kind of gets to some of the discussion we had um, prior to the event. Uh, industry has been following the progression of programs such as Skyborg, um, AFRLs, OBSS, and now operational imperatives for NGAD and B21 family of systems. Um, seemingly standalone efforts, but obviously similar in ecosystem support. How is a headquarters Air Force capitalizing on synergies across these programs and communicating that to industry? So it's a, it's a great question, and I'm going to answer it in two different ways. First of all, one of the things we're doing, and I, I will also caveat, all of this is very much still a work in progress as these OI uh, initiatives continue. But one of the things we're looking at, and this was an observation that uh, I made uh, shortly after showing up in this role, our, our legacy uh, approach to programs is very finely sliced. Uh, some, of, some of that's just how that we've, we've done budgets in the past. Some of it is the fact that we do have a lot of great innovation going on that has created a lot of, of little examples. We don't, by any stretch, want to squelch that innovation and prematurely pick a winner. There, there's, there's value in all of those things kind of bubbling up. The, the challenge we run into in a legacy programmatic approach is to say, okay, eventually we are going to pick a winner or all of them lobby to be multiple winners. And, and just because something was an innovative pilot, now we end up with a sustainment tail. So, so we're examining new kinds of program approaches for, for autonomy, but also really across other aspects of the OIs that, that do a certain amount of bundling, you know, where we can allow all of these little, uh, you know, some people I've talked to already uh, will get sick of me saying this. I refer to them as the chicklets, you know, because you get these uh, program charts that have all these little program names on them and look like a plate full of chicklets. 
But you know, we're, we want to let them continue to grow and evolve and let the innovation happen at a grassroots level, but then create a program structure over the top that can integrate those together. And in the process, you know, maybe some of them be, do become the best athletes and continue to move forward. You know, maybe some of them drop off. Maybe collectively, none of them as a specific program moves forward, but they all create the, the foundation you know, a framework or a, a, a reference architecture to then go to the next step. So that's still a work in progress, but but I recognize that you got all these little program activities going on. There's another really critical aspect of the question. And to some extent, this is where we're pushing in some of these family of system OIs. We've got to start making autonomy real today. Uh, there's going to constantly be more of these types of programs that are going to continue to mature and evolve the s and And as the s and evolves, you're going to get AI and autonomy that becomes more capable of doing more missions. But we know there are some missions where the autonomy and the AI is mature enough to be able to use now. What we're missing is what I'll generically call the dot mil PF. How do you test autonomy? How do you certify it? Something that's inherently meant to be adaptive. How do we train with it? What are we going to have to do to our TTPs and our doctrine and our con ops to be able to take advantage of it and support it? How are we going to sustain it? Is it something that it's a fire and forget? I built my autonomous algorithm and it's done. Or do I need something that's more like, you know, the, the EW world or, or, or even other things we talked about in my mosaic life where you're constantly evolving it and the tactics at an operational timeline. Those are the issues that we need to be starting to work now with whatever the level of autonomy exists. And then I don't care if we've got, you know, a field of a thousand tulips going on, continuing to mature the S&T. Yeah, no, that's very good. As you, you beat me to the use of the term dot mil PF. Uh, and also part of your question gets to the point, um, or part of your discussion and your answer gets to the point of developing people the human resources inside the Air Force um, who can escape the stovepipe organizational structure that we have. So they, they can think in terms of not just one of those individual letters in the .mil PF acronym, but all of them. Um, because um, these stovepipes drive us into these anachronistic concepts that have been so enmeshed in our uh, ecosphere, like the requirements process. Um, uh, it, that's a whole subject of another hour discussion, but let me move on to, and one of the questions kind of fits right into what some of you just, dis, what you just discussed. This is from uh, Colonel Bert Van Heel for the Netherlands Air and Space Attaché. Right now, it sounds like a very logical concept to pursue, but what's the projected timeline? When should we be able to operate all of these concepts? Either one of you. I'm going to turn that over to Tim. <laughs> yeah, so I, I mean, I, it's, that's still very much a work in progress. And again, I don't want to get out ahead of where the studies are and where some of the programs are. But I, I will say that in general, uh, We've got some of this already. We have autonomous systems already in operations. And I go back to the example of the, uh, uh, you know, something like a Global Hawk that doesn't have a pilot. It has a, you know, someone who's trained, you know, in a lot of cases trained as a navigator or, or an intelligence analyst who can click waypoints on a map. That's a certain level of autonomy. Um, the, the, uh, I could imagine moving in the direction of, again, the simpler the task, the faster we're going to see the autonomy field. Uh, I think we're already at the level for things like, uh, you know, sensing support. Uh, we're already there in terms of the level of the S and T. We got to go do those dot mil PF things I just talked about. Uh, but that's not, that's not decades. You know, that's, that's probably at most years to get some of that level of autonomy feel. And again, it's gonna be a continuous kind of evolution. You know, as the, as the S&T and the AI matures, then we're gonna be able to get more aggressive about what types of missions that we end up with. 
you know, what I don't, what we need to be really careful about is we don't let, you know, this is an overused cliche, but the perfect be the enemy of good enough. Um, you can always find some corner case or some mission uh, that autonomy isn't ready for. Um, you know, the, the fully uncontrolled, you know, loitering, you know, RoboCop type platform. You know, I, we don't, we cannot wait until we've solved all of those problems to move out and do some of this. Um, and in fact, you know, maybe we decide we never want to get to something like that. Uh, you know, if we spend a decade studying it and trying to beat our head against it, only to decide, yeah, it's not a good idea. Look at all that time and opportunity we've wasted. So we, we've got to start working the operationalization and fielding of this today. Oh, very good. I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, while this is a journey, there need to be uh, uh, off ramps. Um, on that pathway that we're following to do what Tim just suggested and that not suggested, but uh, emphasize we've, we've got to turn the concepts into reality um, when they're ready. I um, mean, here's one from John Harper for the Fed scoop. Uh, my question is for Mr. Uh, Grayson. How important will loitering munitions be uh, for the future force and how much of a threat do these systems pose to U.S. forces. So loitering munitions isn't something that we're spending a lot of time looking at right now. I think I go back to the, you know, the, the, my, my previous comment. Uh, there are certain things where the autonomy becomes really risky and really challenging. And, you know, I, I don't think we should set that as the goalpost. Um, so I, I think we've got a lot of other options where we can still keep, uh, you know, human on the loop and have some of these, these platforms there basically as trucks. And certainly in the near to midterm, yeah, I, I haven't seen things related to loitering munitions uh, pop up as much in the discussion. That's great. Here's a good one uh, from uh, Larry Stutzream for Caitlin Lee. The current population of RPA airmen have shown themselves to be a very innovative community. Is there a risk the Air Force disrupts this group as the Reaper community is drawn down? Aren't the experience and skills of these airmen critical to the on-ramp of uninhabited capabilities? Thanks for that question, General Stutzream. Uh, I do think that's a huge risk. I was just on the phone yesterday with the, the weapons school, the Reaper weapons school. And the stuff that they're doing and they're thinking about is, frankly, very much aligned with what Dr. Grayson and um, Dave Ockmanic were talking about today. I mean, they're, they're thinking about how to use sensors and how to do jamming in a very contested environment. Um, they're thinking about doing it with Reaper. And so I think uh, the, the innovation and the thought is there in this community, and they've, like, they've been doing it for the past two decades. And the weapons school, I think it may be the biggest weapons school of all the weapons platforms. So there's really quite a bit of institutional knowledge there. And um, you don't necessarily, I mean, really, you know, it's the, the airframe is what it is. Sure, there's certain characteristics that the airframes are going to need to have to operate in a very high threat environment. But you can try out a lot of these payloads, sensors, jamming techniques, data links. You can try it all out on the Reaper. And these guys are actually doing that every day. So a huge, rich resource there um, that we definitely want to want to preserve going forward. And Caitlin, I'm also going to give the last question to you and just the opportunity uh, to comment on a question from uh, uh, Ricardo Marquez. What research and reports can we expect from the new center over the course of the upcoming year? So could you give our audience just a real brief overview of what you've got on your plate? Yes, absolutely. Um, so one of the, the big ones and the first one is going to be on, not surprising given our topic today, UAVs and great power conflict. So looking at exactly some of the things that Dr. Grayson was discussing in terms of um, okay, we've got these two operational imperatives that propose manned on man teaming. What are some of the attributes that UAVs have that could be useful? And so really starting at it from, um, you know, kind of the approach that Dave Ockmanic described where, you know, what's the operational problem we're trying to solve? What are some, where are the capability gaps and where can UAVs potentially fit in? What attributes do they need to have? So 
first project is looking at that. But I think there's a lot of work that we need to do in the future on the AI side as well. Um, and really looking forward to working with Dr. Grayson on that and talking more about autonomy, AI, what that actually looks like, how do we operationalize it critically. Um, I think that'll be another major focus as well. And then, of course, um, the force structure question. I think that's a perennial one. Uh, Dave, you mentioned this issue of mass. And so how do we sort of trade trade off um, in the force structure? Uh, do we need lots of lots of little cheap UAVs or do we just need a few exquisite ones? So it's looking, looking at some of that trade space as well. Well, very good. And ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our Mitchell Institute's rollout of our new Center for UAV and Autonomy Studies. It was really great to have uh, Caitlin Lee, Tim Grayson, and uh, Dave Alkmanik here with us today. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Yeah. And from all of us at the Mitchell Institute, have a great aerospace power kind of day. <laughs> thank you for the Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it.